This is lecture 15, Principles of Metabolism course, and in this lecture we will look at nucleotide metabolism. So uh, I thought I'd spend some time first to do an overview of nucleotides. This looks like a very busy slide, but we'll go through it uh, in, in turn. So first just um, to look at what a nucleotide is, I'm sure everybody knows this, but just to get some terminology and stuff right. So this is the nucleotide, typical structure, consists of a phosphate or sometimes multiple phosphates if it's highly phosphorylated. There's a ribose linkage, it's this part, and this can be sometimes a deoxyribose if it's DNA deoxyribonucleotide. Uh, uh, and then there's the base, which could be uh, several cases here. So that's the nucleobase. So um, nucleotides can be de novo synthesized. All of them can be synthesized de novo in humans from uh, ribose uh, and from amino acids, largely as the source of carbon and nitrogen for the nucleobase. And we have the familiar four nucleobases, A, G, C, U, and then we have the thymidine base, but we'll get to that. Uh, and this is what they look like. Adenine and guanine are purines, common name for the class, so they have these double rings, and the cytosine and uracilla pyrimidines. So as you can see, there's a lot of nitrogen here, and so it stands to reason that this comes from amino acids. So these um, rings are assembled in, in pretty complicated synthesis pathways from amino acids. Uh, and uh, some carbon is used also from the one carbon pool, which is a uh, sort of methyl type of groups that are carried by uh, by folate. But there are de novo synthesis pathways for these. Um, and uh, then what you have above these, uh, the actual nucleobases, sort of this part, is really a large system of uh, various kinases uh, that can change between the, the different uh, phosphate forms. So the first step after de novo synthesis is that you, you phosphorylate uh, this part, the, the nucleoside, that's phosphorylated once, and then you get a, a monophosphate or a nucleotide. So it's tied when it has a phosphate group on it. Uh, and then you can have additional kinases. So you can get a diphosphate, you can get a triphosphate of all of these. Uh, and then your phosphorylases, you can go back, and there's a, a large number of these enzymes that exchange phosphate groups back and forth between these species. Um, so, but one important feature is um, the distinction now between the ribonucleotides, so that would be these, uh, and so they look like this, and the deoxy uh, ribonucleotides, so the DNA type of nucleotides. So these two pools are really sort of separated, uh, and they are separated at this step. So there's this enzyme ribonucleotide reductase, we'll look at this a bit in detail, uh, that basically just reduces one of these groups take away one of the hydroxy uh, groups there. And that's enough to make a different shape that is handled completely separately. So that gives you an entirely separate pool here with, again, all the different bases and all the three phosphate forms. Um, so uh, this is actually not super complicated. There are just these different subsystems. Uh, there's just a lot of enzymes in, in, in this chart, but we kind of don't have to worry about all the details. We can look at these different pools and subsystems separately. So um, that's pretty much it, except for the thymidine base. Um, so thymidine is handled differently. Uh, and uh, I don't know, perhaps this has something to do with getting real specificity for the DNA synthesis, because DNA synthesis obviously cannot proceed unless you have the thymidine base. So here you have a sort of extra control step. Unless you make this step, you you don't allow DNA synthesis. Uh, and, and that might have been useful for, for biological organisms in many ways. So there is this timidlate kinase enzyme, which is controlling the conversion from, from U to T here. So it, it does a, a modification to the base. Uh, and then this is done at the monophosphate level, and then this can be phosphorylated up again. So you have kind of the fifth base, the thymidine, is kind of sort of playing on the side here. So that's the general overview um, of the nucleotide metabolism. This is the overall structure. Um, 
Oh, and I should say that these can also, there's also some degradation pathways. Um, the pyrimidines can be uh, degraded down to alanine, and the purines can be degraded to urate. Uh, generally, we don't get a lot of energy out of oxidizing nucleotides, as you might expect, because there's lots of nitrogen in, in these uh, structures. So it's not very good substrates for oxidation. But there are a, a few sort of degradation steps. So uh, let's look a bit at the synthesis pathways to start with. So we'll look at a few aspects of, of purine synthesis. Uh, this is a pretty long and complex pathway, and there's no point in going through all of it. Uh, you can easily look these things up in the databases that we have been working with, uh, if you're interested in particular steps or, or aspects. But a couple of things. So uh, purine synthesis starts out with a ribose phosphate. So this pathway is phosphorylated throughout. There's always a phosphate group uh, hanging on to these purines. Um, and the first step that we do in purine synthesis is a kind of activation. So we use ATP in the first step, and it's a bit of an unusual kinase. It's one of these that actually takes off a diphosphate or a pyrophosphate and leaves AMP. And this pyrophosphate group is attached uh, to the uh, ribose phosphate. So now we have something called a phosphoribose diphosphate, PRPP. Uh, so this is a high energy compound. We have a, a high energy kind of bond here that we can use to drive other reactions. And in this case, this is used to uh, attach an amine group to that position. So we're using glutamine as an amine donor. So you might recall this amino acid has an extra amine group towards the end. Uh, so that is donated. Uh, glutamate is the result there. And here's where the amine group ends up. So to form this bond, this, um, this is an amino sugar type of bond because this is a sugar but it has an amine group. So this is actually an amino sugar. Uh, so to form this we need a bit of energy. So that's why we have this um, sort of activated phosphate group here to drive that. And now when we have got the amine group on, we are sort of ready to start building the nucleobase. And um, I'll just show the first reaction. So the first reaction uses ATP. It's a ligase. So it um, ligates a glycine, another uh, amino acid, onto this position. Uh, so now we have built out already two carbons and, and two nitrogens of the uh, what's going to be the nucleobase. Uh, and then there are several steps like this where we are ligating or uh, adding on to several, uh, several atoms more to build this ring uh, of the purine. And you can look this up. It's a fascinating pathway, but it's uh, a bit much to go through. Um, and this is energy demanding. Several of these reactions require ATP, three ATP in total. Um, and we get these various components uh, for the purine ring. Uh, from these one carbon units which are carried by folate. So that's a kind of, it's a formal group actually that is carried by folate. It's added onto here. It's like one carbon at a time we are building this structure. Um, a car, a CO2 is also used in one of the steps. And we get a couple of more nitrogens from glutamine and aspartate so from amino acids. So um, it's kind of fascinating. This is a pathway that really assembles a structure Know, atom by atom, uh, but in the end we get this uh, purine base, and this is no, now um, inosine monophosphate, so IMP. So you may not have heard much about inosine, but when it comes to the biosynthesis of purines, this is actually kind of the central point, uh, and then AMP and GMP are um, just modifications of this base. So um, that's purine synthesis, and one thing to note is that even though this is biosynthetic, it's not actually reductive. So when we looked at fatty acid synthesis, that uses a lot of reduction to build carbon-carbon bond. Uh, but here we see, if you look at the um, oxidation numbers as we did before of this base, you see that because there are so many nitrogens in here, the carbons are actually not highly reduced. So that makes sense that there is really no reduction going on here. We're not using NADH or NADPH uh, for uh, reduction in this case. Now, pyrimidine biosynthesis is a bit different from, from purines. Um, and we'll look at a couple of differences. So 
This pathway starts from uh, carbamyl phosphate. So as you might recall, this metabolite is also part of the urea cycle. So it's a small metabolite with a carbon, sort of carboxyl type of group here, and then an amine group, and then it's phosphorylated. And uh, carbamyl phosphate reacts first with aspartate uh, and forms this uh, carbamyl aspartate molecule. So you have the carbamyl group here, and this part is the aspartate amino acid. And uh, then there is a kind of ring closing reaction. So this uh, part sort of falls over here and reacts, and water is leaving. And that already forms the um, pyrimidine ring, this part. So um, this looks much simpler than, than purine synthesis, and it, it is in many ways. Um, and then what happens is uh, a redox reaction. So this part gets oxidized, this particular carbon. Uh, and uh, this involves the respiratory chain. So this is a bit interesting. So you actually have to have a functional respiratory chain to be able to synthesize pyrimidines. And uh, now we have something called orotate. This is already a, a pyrimidine base. And only at this step do we now involve the, uh, the sugar, the uh, ribose. And again, it's this uh, activated ribose form with the pyrophosphate group on it that's being used. Uh, and this pyrophosphate is cleaved off to drive the reaction and to form this bond so that we have this, the sugar uh, attached to the pyrimidine ring in this case. Uh, and then we have a decarboxylation left and then we, are, we have arrived at, at uridine phosphate. So um, that's all of pyrimidine biosynthesis. So you can see it's a bit different. Um, there are several steps here intermediate steps which just involve sort of free metabolites that uh, or free bases that are not attached to the sugar and they're not phosphorylated either so they're a bit different now when it comes to degrading nucleotides as we said we probably won't get much energy out of this because there's a lot of uh, of nitrogen in the nucleobases uh, but we might get some. So let's just look um, a little bit at the purine degradation pathways. So um, here we are starting from adenosine. So this is the um, uh, nucleoside without the phosphate group. So it has been dephosphorylated already. Um, and uh, there's only a couple of steps here. Uh, in the case of adenosine, we first do a deamination uh, to get rid of uh, this uh, amine group and put a a water there instead. Uh, and then we uh, cleave off the actual um, uh, sugar group and now we have the free uh, nucleobase. So this is called hyposanthine. This is a little uh, confusing perhaps because the corresponding nucleoside, the one with the sugar, is called inosine and this is called hyposanthine. But as you can see this, this is the same base as that one so it's just kind of naming convention, happens to be called this. Uh, and if you look, look at hyposanthine, there's a couple of places where we can sort of get some energy. There's a couple of carbons that we can actually oxidize. So it's this one and it's this one. And if you work this out and look at the oxidation numbers, uh, oxidation states uh, of these carbons, you can see that this is actually kind of equivalent to carboxyl groups. So these two uh, are something that we can do something with. So there's one sort of oxidation state left. And um, sure enough, what happens is that in the first step, uh, we oxidize this particular group and put a double bonded oxygen on here. And that gives us an NADH. Uh, and in the second step, uh, we, we oxidize the others, that's this group. Uh, and now we have arrived at something which is pretty much as oxidized as it can get. Uh, this is called urate or uric acid. And in humans, this is excreted. Uh, in some animals, this is broken down further, uh, but primates have lost this, the other pathways. So, so we sort of stop here, and this is the, the waste product. In the case of guanosine, well, it's pretty similar, uh, but note that guanosine already has this nitrogen here. So this position is not available for oxidation in this case. So all we can do here is we can first get rid of the sugar, the ribose, uh, and then again we do a deamination and then we arrive uh, at this intermediate, so this is xanthine. 
and then we could do one uh, oxidation, one dehydrogenase, and get one NADH out of this, and then we're done. So we can get a couple of NADH uh, from this, but overall for a molecule this large, there is not that much energy that we can get from nucleotide degradation. And there's a similar, well, there's a different pathway uh, for pyrimidine degradation. Uh, and that case is actually a little better. We can get an alanine out of pyrimidine degradation. I won't look at that in detail, but uh, uh, you can, can look it up. And the final component that um, sort of completes uh, nucleotide uh, metabolism is the salvage pathways. It's really not sort of a pathway, it's largely just one reaction for, for each um, uh, nucleobase or each base that we are interested in. Uh, but these are enzymes that essentially just capture free nucleobases that happens to be lying around. Maybe they have been degraded before. Uh, by other cells, or maybe they were found, found in the diet. Uh, and so what these uh, salvaged enzymes do is that they, they use, again, this activated form of ribase, the uh, PRPP, the phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate form, uh, which is high energy. So they use that, cleave off the pyrophosphate group so that they can attach uh, the sugar to the nucleobase. And there's a couple of enzymes for these, for adenine and for guanine. And there's one for hyposanthine also, which is a product in some cases, uh, so that can be useful to be able to salvage. And in that case, we get IMP. So salvage enzymes. Uh, and uh, these are important because, as we saw, it's pretty energetically costly to make purines from scratch. There's a lot of ATP that's expended in this to make all of these, all of these bonds between atoms. Um, so if there are nuclear bases available, uh, it makes sense to use them. And that's exactly what cells do. So as long as there are nucleotides around, salvage pathways tend to predominate. Um, and only when you are starved for, for nuclear bases, when a proliferating cell cannot find nuclear bases, then they turn on the, the de novo synthesis pathways. There are um, salvage pathways for the pyrimidines as well, but I'm not going to look at them here. Um, instead, we're just going to finish by looking quickly at deoxynucleotides. So there's not really that much to it. Um, it's uh, the same basis, uh, largely, except for thymidine. Um, but uh, I want to look just quickly at the one enzyme that sort of controls the, um, uh, the partition between the ribonucleotides and the uh, deoxyribonucleotides. Uh, and that's ribonucleotide reductase. And this uh, enzyme has been studied a lot because it's, uh, it's very important to proliferating cells. It's um, restricted to S phase uh, and controlled by a lot of, uh, of growth factors and cell cycle regulating machinery and stuff like that. And uh, of course, it's been investigated a lot in, in cancer. So uh, what this enzyme does, it's a, it's a redox enzyme and it acts on this particular group of the, uh, of the sugar, the ribose, and uh, reduces this so that we get uh, just a hydrogen bonded here instead of the uh, hydroxy group. Uh, and it uses NADPH as the, um, as the reducing agent. Uh, and uh, this is really the, uh, the divider between the two pools. And there is really no way of going back, so you can make the oxy uh, nucleotides from ribonucleotides, but not the other way around. Uh, generally, in cells, you have much more ribonucleotides around because uh, if you remember the cell composition uh, stuff we did in the first couple of lectures, uh, the ribonucleotides in RNA is much more abundant than DNA. And of course, it also turns over a lot, whereas DNA is usually static unless you're actually dividing, unless the cell is actually dividing. Um, so this is kind of a one-way process, but it sort of makes sense given the amounts uh, of nucleotides. Uh, the other thing you can do with um, the oxynucleotides, there are salvage pathways. So um, if you find the nucleosides, the uh, deoxy form with, uh, with the nucleobase but without the phosphate, uh, these tend to uh, crop up if DNA has been degraded. Uh, and so this can be recaptured, and that's just a, a kinase. You just add on the phosphate group, 
uh, and then you get the uh, the oxynucleotide back and so that can be used again and that's of course energetically efficient again like the uh, other salvage pathways we looked at um, and finally it is possible to degrade the deoxynucleotides as well so what happens is that the uh, nuclear base is just cleaved off first and that can be used then for uh, either for RNA or for, for DNA for ribo or deoxyribonucleotides and the um, sugar which is now a bit unusual which has this hydroxy group uh, has a dedicated pathway where this can be catabolized uh, and uh, fed back into central metabolism so it, it can be saved as well uh, so that's uh, pretty much uh, everything about the oxynucleotides and nucleotide metabolism